The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who calls all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read them, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may ever embrace and hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in, our Son, in your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you all for coming. Um, this class is a course that I have taught on Thursday nights. Um, and the, the emphasis for the class was that often um, people, who, gays and lesbians in our community, have found certain scriptures to be troublesome or they've been used as ammunition um, and, and used as tools of hate. So I wanted us to examine those scriptures together. Um, and we'll discuss some background of, of the information and we'll look at some of the Hebrew translations, especially in the one today. And we'll look deeper into these stories to see what they're really about. It's not always about what you think it is. So, uh, in fact, most of the time it's not. And these are fun discoveries to make as a group. So, we'll get started. Um, because we're talking about some sensitive topics, I wanted to include this. This is how we have covenanted to uh, work together in the Diocese of Southern Virginia. Uh, we, we ask that everyone listen attentively, uh, practice courtesy, respect all opinions, speak for self only, and refrain from judging others, either their motives or their spiritual maturity. This is the outline of the course that we used in, on the Thursday night course. Um, and next week we will not meet because there is a, um, a presentation by the vestry at this time. But in the weeks following, we'll cover these topics. I don't know that we can cover the entire one in a week, so we may have to move it to two weeks. Uh, but we'll see. I think we can get it done in six weeks. Uh, the Anglicans view the Bible a little differently than other denominations. Um, scripture, tradition, and reason define the way we approach life and the Bible and faith. And uh, we are not biblical literalists. Uh, we read the Bible in context and uh, we use it to apply to our lives guided by tradition and reason. Uh, we do believe Holy Scripture is inspired Word of God and it is authoritative, but it's only authoritative insofar as it's balanced with Scripture, with tradition and reason. Just a word, a quick word on translations. Um, sometimes it helps to read these paraphrase scriptures. I think Wynn used the message to send out those calls to prayer during Holy Week. Um, these do a lot of the guesswork for you. Uh, they will idiomatically translate a phrase rather than word for word. So it will sound more like the way we talk now or it'll make some uh, leaps that uh, uh, in other places uh, the translators give you a footnote. So. These are word for word. The NRSV is the standard for college uh, and university study of scripture. NIV is one, um, the NIV scholars didn't like what the NRSV did, so they created their own. The NRSV in a couple of places uh, was true to the translation rather than to their theology. So in Isaiah, in the NRSV, you get uh, a maiden shall conceive the NIV guys didn't like that, so they went back and changed it to virgin, and, and so they made, some, um, m they made some choices like that that um, forced them to make a new translation. The New American Standard, the Dewey Reams, they're all good. I would encourage you to compare those with others. You'll get a fuller picture of what you're reading. So on to our topic for today. What do you think of when you hear Sodom? or Sodom and Gomorrah, and we're all adults, so. Uh, kind of back in debauchery, generally speaking. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. No inhibitions or lacking inhibitions in general. Uh-huh. Lacking inhibitions and debauchery, he said. Immorality. Immorality, yeah. 
Sexual immorality, right? Yeah, yeah. What else? Brimstone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what becomes a sexual immorality. Yeah. I'm sa say it again. Salt. Salt, yeah, Lot's wife, that's right, yeah. I li that story's interesting to me. I wonder if that's not an idiom for grief. She crystallized into a pillar of salt, uh, meaning she cried, she mourned, and was not able to move on, rather than being a literal, but anyway. Um, Am I remembering correctly, there was also other things other than debauchery going on, like they were murdering and cheating one another and just awful evil? Yeah, yeah. And actually, uh, debauchery is only there if you read a Hebrew word a certain way, and we'll get there. Yeah, yeah. So let's, let's turn to the story. Um, I'll read this to you since I have the microphone. Then the men set out from there, and they looked towards Sodom, and Abraham, Abraham went with them to set them on their way. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. No, for I have chosen him, that he may charge his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, How great is the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah, and how very grave their sin. I must go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me, and if not, I will know. So the men turned from there and went towards Sodom, while Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham came near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not forgive it for the fifty righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom fifty righteous in the city, I will forgive the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered, Let me take it upon myself to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the fifty are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five there. And he spoke to him, Suppose forty are found there, he answered, For the sake of forty I will not do it. Then he said, O Lord, do not, let, o, do not let the Lord be angry if I speak. Suppose thirty are found there, he answered, I will not do it if I find thirty. Abraham's very bold. He's bargaining with God here. He said, Let me take it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty are found. And he answered, For the sake of twenty, I will not destroy it. Then he said, O Lord, O do not let the Lord be angry if I speak just once more. Suppose ten are found there. And he answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. He said, Please, my lords, turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you can rise early and go on your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the square. But he urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may know them. Lot went out of the door to the men, shut the door after him, and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Look, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Let me bring them out to you, and do to them as you please, 
Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they replied, Stand back. And they said, This fellow came here as an alien, and he would play the judge? Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near the door to break it down. But the men inside reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the door of the house, both great and small, so that they were unable to find the door. And so as you read this, what do you hear is the sin of Sodom? Prejudice. Prejudice. Mm -hmm. um, arrogance. That's exactly that. That's actually in another book of the Bible that it says their arrogance was their sin. Yeah. 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 Um, notice here, it's I can't believe that we focus in on homosexuality. I'm appalled that he would uh, send his daughters out. I mean, <laughs> nobody ever focuses on that, but. Um, but there's some things going on here uh, in this culture that we don't uh, understand. And one, we'll get to it uh, more in detail, but one is the um, huge obligation for hospitality. Well, any other thoughts about the sin of Sodom? So is it male-to-male -male genital expression? I didn't read that in there. Nope. Could it be in hospitality? Yeah. yeah, that sounds like, I mean, he, he made him come in for the, from the square. He knew something bad would happen. He didn't let him stay out. And it could be an act of shaming, and we'll read more about that at the end of the class. Um, honor, shame society, we, we're, we live in a guilt society. Um, Honor shame society um, is, is what the Old Testament and the New Testament were composed in, and honor and shame were uh, fluid in a culture. You could um, acquire shame if you failed at business or disrespected your family or whatever. Uh, and then honor was gained either by someone falling at your feet to thank you for something. You know, uh, Mary Magdalene washes Jesus' feet. Um, that's assigning all her honor to him by bowing down to him that way. So there's a currency of honor in this culture that we don't really pick up on when we're reading this. So that plays a lot into the story as well. And then uh, this one word, uh, yada, kind of makes all the difference in the world to this passage. So. They called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may know them. This is the Hebrew word yada. Uh, the article I read on this called it yada, yada, yada was the title. So, uh, uh, scholastic humor. But um, to know is the Hebrew word for yada. And then it is used 943 times in Hebrew scripture. And only 10 of those times is there a sexual connotation. So by far, the use is not to mean having sex with someone. It means to know um, maybe an intimate knowledge, but that's not the necessarily the same thing as having sex. So if you think about what's going on in Sodom, they know they're about to be destroyed. They've got two strangers in their midst that they think they could be spies for all they know. And they're calling them out. We want to know what these guys are here for. Um, you could see that rather than a sexual uh, connotation there. How did Sodom know they were going to be destroyed? I missed that. How did how, in Sodom? In Sodom? Well, I mean, it's, it's implicit in the story. It's not explicit. So, they, so Abraham knows. And he's talking to God. Apparently, there, can't, there were enemies camped out there or something. I mean, okay. there's more to it than just natural disaster. You have to read that into the story somewhat. So. so, yada to know um, comes from, uh, it's found in these 
verses. In Genesis 4.1, that's when Adam knew his wife and she bore a son. In 1 Samuel, this reminds me of my Bible drill days as a Baptist. 1 Samuel 1.19. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. Again, that, that's a sexual connotation. 1 Kings 1.4. I'm surprised I know which way to go. That's pretty good. I know, really. First Kings 1 Kings 1.4, the girl was very beautiful. She became the king's attendant and served him, but the king did not know her sexually in that case. Now just look at 2 Samuel 14.20 for the sake of time. In order to change the course of affairs, your servant Joab did this. But my Lord has wisdom like the wisdom of the angels of God to know all things that are on the earth. So there's other places where, and this is the same Hebrew word. So there's a range of meanings, and it's interesting to me that all the commentaries, most of the footnotes I've read, all take the sexual connotation route with this passage rather than just simple knowledge. So we have um, one possibility for the sin of Sodom is inhospitality. And um, Michael, this goes exactly to what you said. In the book of Sirach, uh, 16.8, the, uh, this is what it says. He did not spare the neighbors of Lot, whom he loathed on account of their arrogance. It says nothing about debauchery, sexual immorality, simply pride and arrogance there. In the book of wisdom, we get this. The punishment did not come upon the sinners without prior signs in the violence of thunder. And this is talking about Sodom. For they justly suffered because of their wicked acts. For they practiced a more bitter hatred of strangers. Others had refused to receive strangers when they came to them. And these made slaves of guests who were their benefactors. So that's... Again, inhospitality is the theme there. In Ezekiel, it says, As I live, says the Lord God, your sister Sodom and her daughters have not done as you and your daughters have done. This was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excessive food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and the needy. So that's from Scripture, what the sins of Sodom are. That's not from commentaries. Um, any, any observations or questions about that? Or? Yeah. Um, talking about inhospitality from the Greek and the Roman tradition, hospitality was so important, it was associated with Zeus and Jupiter. And I often have to remind people that it's very different in those days. Nowadays, we want to travel you go online, you find mm -hmm. the Holiday Inn, you find the next one in the next town. Uh, they did not have that. And so if somebody were at your house, you had that obligation to take care of them. Otherwise, no one could travel. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So yeah. it, it, that is more important that we think of, mm -hmm. oh, be nice to your guests, and feed them a good meal. Uh, it, it, it was something that the wrath of Zeus would come down on your head in that tradition. Mm -hmm. you know? So it would be... Well, in the Hebrew tradition as well, they're, yeah. they're, they live in the desert. So if you get stranded, you're dead. Hospitality is a mat matter of life and death in, in this climate. Um, the cultural norm, interestingly, was that you protect the honor of your guests even at the expense of your own household. That's hard for us to swallow. Um, I would, if I had to name a sin here, I would say that Lot cared so little for his daughters. Um, <laughs> But it was understandable in that culture, still not understandable to me, but it, it was a cultural norm here that you protected your guests, even at the expense of your own life. We read last week about um, 
the foot washing, and Jesus says to Peter, well, you didn't wash my feet. And, and well, it was, well, they're talking about Mary Magdalene. Anyway, he says, well, you didn't wash my feet, and here she's come to anoint me for my burial. Well, he was, he was saying, you, you didn't provide for me hospitality. And that was a valid um, claim that he had for that society. So that's just how important uh, hospitality was, even symbolic hospitality of washing feet. We've made it into a symbol, but I mean, it wasn't life sustaining, but it was a, a hospitality to show someone. The second possibility is, like I've said before, the honor shame society. This, the sin of uh, Sodom could be shame. And that could have been what the, the men were looking uh, to do. Even if their uh, intentions were sexual, it's rape. It's not uh, consensual sex. I mean, they're asking them to throw this, these men out into a mob. So uh, if that's the case, if, it is a, if there is a sexual connotation, then it's shame that is the issue here. And they're trying in their culture, honor, shame. You, you may, uh, the Japanese have this in their culture now. If, you know when the economy fails in Japan, the suicide rate goes way up. Well, if you bring shame upon your firm or upon your family, it's the noble thing to check out. Um, so that's, that's more like what we're talking about here in an honor, shame society. So there's a story in Judges, and I apologize before I read it because it's pretty graphic. Um, but this has, it's, it's almost the exact identical story of Sodom and Gomorrah, but here the shaming aspect is more explicit. When they were enjoying themselves, the men of the city, this is Gibeah, a depraved lot surrounded the house and started pounding on the door. They said to the old man, the master of the house, bring out the man who came into your house so that we may have intercourse with him. Here it's not Yada. So, and the, ma the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, No, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Since this man is my guest, do not, let this vile, do not do this vile thing. Here are my virgin daughter and his concubine. Let me bring them out now. Ravish them and do whatever you want to them. But against this man do no such a vile thing. But the men would not listen to him, so the man seized his concubine and put her out to them. They wantonly raped her and abused her all through the night until the morning. And as the dawn began to break, they let her go. As morning appeared, the woman came and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was until it was light. In the morning, her master got up, opened the doors of the house, and, went, and when he went out to go on his way, there was his concubine lying on, at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. Get up, he said to her, we are going. But there was no answer. Then he put her on the donkey and the man set out for his home. When he entered his house, he took a knife and grasping his concubine, he cut her into 12 pieces, limb by limb, and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. Then he commanded the men whom he sent, saying, Thus shall you say to all the Israelites, Has such a thing ever happened since the day that the Israelites came up from the land of Egypt until this day? Consider it, take counsel, and speak out. That's not normally in our lectionary. Oh. <laughs> So it's it's pretty uh, rough story, but here um, we can see more of a shaming element. It's, it could be that the they want to bring the man out to shame him. They obviously raped this woman. That's a, a tool of shame and uh, of dominance. So um, this is probably the story Sodom and Gomorrah is based on, or vice versa. Uh, they could have both been oral stories, and these are the skeletons of the story and each have made uh, slight modifications to these stories. But what, what is your knee-jerk reaction to this graphic story? And by the way, it's not implicit here, but she was already dead when he cut her up. So uh, it doesn't say that, but that's, yeah, that was understood. What's the different Hebrew word that distinguishes the 
And of course, I looked it up uh, when I did the class, and I don't remember how to pronounce it, but it is a different word. Um, and it has to do, uh, it's not rape though, which there is a word for, uh, obviously, they use that word in here as well. So, um, is it used in other places as well? So I'd have to look it up, you know. Uh, sorry. I was just curious when you talked about the 943 and the 10, so I wondered if that word had been used in. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I can look that up and find out and have it for you next time. Yes, ma'am. So is the chopping up the concubine and serving out 12 pieces and the messenger and things supposed to be some sort of metaphor of the diaspora or something? Or? It could be, but it's more of a, um, sending out to the 12 tribes saying, take, look, look what happened to this woman. This is how far we've come since we came from the land of Egypt. We need to do something about it. Speak out, he says. So it's a warning. I'm, you know, you didn't have the printing press, so I guess you had to improvise <laughs> for your messages. But you, you see this even. I mean, they're barbaric in England. Um, even after after Jesus, they're cutting up people and sending them to the four corners, uh, traitors especially, to say this is what happens to you if you do this. So I mean, it's very similar here. Did you have George? Did you have a comment? Okay. <clears throat> uh, Ken Stone writes this, um, there seems to be quite a number of narrative biblical texts in which a woman is represented as the means with which one male challenges the honor and power of another male. Michael, this goes exactly to what you were saying. Moreover, the nature of this challenge is quite frequently a sexual one. Any comments about shame or Maybe that this is the sin of Sodom. Uh, any other questions about what we've read here? All right. So does this story give us any conclusive evidence that the sin of Sodom was homosexuality? No. Nope. Uh, in fact, that homosexuality, that, that uh, term and that uh, idea didn't even exist then. That didn't come along till the 19th century. So what was the sin of Sodom? We've named them, but let's just recall them now. Arrogance was one. Inhospitality. What else? Could be shame. Yeah, if, you, if we read that into this story and if it's similar to this one of Gibeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am? Exactly, yes. Yep. Violence in general. Mob violence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And but there was uh, already some issue with the righteousness because God was going to destroy them. So it's not only what they did in the square, there's something else going on beforehand, which is what you mentioned there. They were uh cheating. Uh there's some other uh passage that talks about they had uh they put their thumb on the scales, what we would say, but they had some kind of scales that were not true, and they were cheating people, and you know all these things were rampant. So that's why they destroyed them. <clears throat> Any other thoughts about the sin of Sodom? So how does this inform our faith today? Um, especially in light of this being used as a weapon against uh, uh, Late gays and lesbians, transgendered people. Someone in the class on Thursday night said uh, something I hadn't thought about. Uh, it was faith or lies of Dowdy. And they said that um, it's amazing that the sin of Sodom is apparently in hospitality. And the same people that uh, uh, say sodomites or whatever and, and talk about gay people are the ones being inhospitable. Uh, so they're committing the sin of sodomy if you read it this way. All right. Thank you all for coming. Um, we'll continue in two weeks. Next week there's a parish meeting at this time.